Lord, we thank you that you are eternal, you do not change, that we can rely on your word, on your unchanging nature, your unchanging shame. That you, O oh Lord, watch over your word to fulfill it and everything that has proceeded from your mouth, everything that you have said, everything that you have promised is yes in Jesus the Christ. We thank you that you called us. We thank you for the grace to come. We pray and ask, Lord, now that you would strengthen us, transform us and sanctify us to yourself because of the blood of your son shed for us that not even one drop of his blood or one tear or one moment of his suffering would be counted as a waste or lost or for nothing concerning us. Even if no one else wants to come, Lord, we pray and ask that you be jealous for your name among us that you'd bring us, Lord, with you. With all this in mind, Lord, we pray for those who can't be here today, especially those who are sick, or those who, Lord, have other engagements they had to go to. Lord, bless them where they are. Those who are practicing for next week's sports, Lord, we ask that you prosper them in their, their activity, Lord, that you give them success. But, Lord, really that you also deal with them during the week, to bring them along in their faith one way and the other, Lord, whether they are here or not. We thank you, Lord, for a Roa Church in the Philippines that's coming up to their 12th anniversary, even smaller than us to begin with, Lord. We thank you that they're still there and growing and maturing. We pray, Lord, that even now you would spare them from the famine for your word, that you would instruct them and teach them yourself by your spirit. That those who were just kids when we met them and now are adults, Lord, we pray that you'd really anoint them to be your witnesses in this age. And now, Lord, as we turn to your word, we ask you to instruct us according to your promise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, take a seat. So as you can see, um, one way or the other, we have lots of people have to be somewhere else today. So um, we're at... <laughs> but... Do you guys want to go with, so I don't have to do the swivel head thing? Yeah. Um, so tonight's topic, it's nine, nine pages because I want you to keep this one as like a ministry tool that you can, if you're in a situation that you think, oh, I know something about it, you can go back and be reminded. We're not going to go blow by blow through. Obviously, it'd be far too long. So this is one of those ones that you really will get the most out of if you read it during the week yourself a couple of times so the priority tonight is really to i guess equip you with some understanding that might turn into uh, a practical ministry ability down the road how do you know well hands up if you care what happens to your neighbor if you're a christian your hand should be up isn't it what about your enemies? That's the difference between us and the world, isn't it? The world will agree, oh yeah, I care what happens to my neighbour. When you say your enemies, they go, I don't care what happens to them. You know, they can get run over, I don't care. Well, that's what separates us largely from the world, is that we are instructed, we are told to be go beyond where the world stops caring and care even for the worst of our enemies to seek their salvation. Our topic tonight though is well, ask a question if God gives you a burden for a people or a person or a situation and you are his witness in it because they're perishing and he shows you that and he shows you the truth to give them is there a limit to how far you should go trying to save them? So generally you're all nodding, so that's good. Because lots of people don't think there is. Because of something that the church teaches, which I'll come to as we go along. So it's good that we're starting off with a, a, a good understanding. We're told to go further than the world but that further isn't necessarily without ending. Is there a situation where it is without ending? The answer is yes, which I'll also cover in a second, but God gives people in that situation a particular grace to stand, even until they're martyred, you know, until where it costs them their life. 
but that's not a regular situation, thankfully. Okay, but if that if he called you into such a situation, you'd have the grace for it as well. So what we want to look at is what to do when God says enough. When you've tried and you've tried and you've tried, how do you know? How can you have confidence when God says, that's it, leave it? Because if you're really a Christian, it's actually really hard to leave it. It's very hard to stop caring, isn't it? And especially if you've invested a lot into somebody or some situation or, you know. Especially if it's family. Especially if it's family, that's right. Like this family is particularly weird because everyone in it is pretty sound in faith. But that is really a weird thing, isn't it? Most families don't have that, not by any stretch of the imagination. So if most parents, most Christian parents, have at least one child that isn't, that they worry about constantly. You know, it's a massive burden. You might have just a friend. Well, I bet you all have friends that you want them to be in heaven in the end. But at the moment, if you're honest, you know they're not going to be, unless something changes, isn't it? So you, you know, if you're if you're really a, if you're really his disciple, part of you will be wanting to make a difference, some kind of difference. But what happens if they just won't listen? So that's what we're going to look at tonight, so that when we get in that situation. We can be standing on solid ground. So the first thing I want to talk about is what the church has been teaching lately. If, there, if you had to put the whole gospel that you hear the church teaching on the internet, and everything, what would you reduce the whole gospel to a sentence? What do you think would be the message these days? Yeah, you're on the right track. What is it? Love, love who? Everyone. everyone. Love everyone. And is that wrong? No. We're commanded to love everyone, even our enemies. So it sounds right. But it's wrong. What makes it wrong? Why is it so dangerous and deadly? Let's see why. In the church, when I say the church, I mean globally, it doesn't matter what denomination. Right now, especially if you're young, this is what they're telling you, is that God loves everybody, therefore you just need to love everyone. But what do they mean by that? Think, what? Accept. You have to accept everybody. How? Accept them how? As they are. Any pressure for them to change? Oh no, that's wrong. The acceptance is you are required to just agree that how they are doesn't matter. Now you've got the church teaching the same thing. What's fundamentally missing there? We have really extreme and obvious examples. Who can give me a really obvious example that you know it's not of God, but and yet the church is teaching that for this exact thing. What would be the most obvious example? The gay thing. Yep. Does God love gay people? Yes. yes. Are they going to heaven as they are? No. And people go, oh, you hate gays. Well, let me rephrase it. Does God love people who are guilty of adultery? Yes. Are they going to heaven if they don't repent? No. Nothing special about being gay. The sin is sexual immorality. All the things on that list. You understand? It's not a gay issue. It's a sexual immorality issue. God loves them, but he's not saving them. Why? Because he's given us the terms 
of the contract for salvation. And it begins with what? The first step is you have to acknowledge that your life is sinful, that you can't go to heaven on your own steam, isn't it? Second step is that follows straight on from the first is repentance. There has to be action. You know, if, you, if you're a cop and you catch some kid stealing, he says, okay, fair enough, I know stealing's wrong. Yep, I confess it's wrong, it's wrong. So, well, that's it, don't let me catch you again. If they go, you go around the corner 10 minutes later and you see them stealing again, you say, oh, it's okay, you confess that you're a thief, so it's all right. No, you arrest them, don't you? You had your warning. Unless there's repentance, the confession is just the first step. It has to, so, and it's for your benefit, not God's. God already knows. He doesn't need you to tell him. He, he's the, trying to get you to see it. So for real salvation to take place, there has to be the acknowledgement of my sin, a deliberate change of heart, a deliberate change of goals, a deliberate change of my life, isn't it? And... I could not reach his standard by just trying that myself. But if I do that, what happens? He gives you the Holy Spirit that suddenly makes possible what would otherwise be impossible. He empowers you to succeed in your repentance. That's what grace is about. That's what the Holy Spirit's there for. He will allow you to succeed in becoming Christ-like where without the Holy Spirit no matter how hard you tried to be holy, you would fall on your face every five minutes. Okay? But if the gospel was, as they're preaching it now, is minus those things, it's also minus what? It's minus salvation. The danger is, the really sad thing is, now you've got the church preaching this message. This is the biggest danger facing any, especially a young person. I remember having a massive argument on, the, on Messenger with Aaron. Because that church he was going to, they preached this. You know, and he'd read one of the sermons and he was trying to challenge me and say, you know, oh, but our, our preacher says God just loves everyone, just have to accept everyone as they are. What is the true what is the true gospel thing? When you come across someone who's really a sinner, what are you supposed to do? Shun them? No. So what is the true version of this that God loves everyone? If you someone may ask you, so here's the here's the easy to remember answer. God gives everyone the same opportunity regardless of where they started. God doesn't care where you came from, only where you're going. So on initially, he doesn't care whether you are a saint or a prostitute. It doesn't make any difference at all to God what you were. You know when people say all, everyone's equal? Does God agree with that? Only at one place. We're all equally useless. We're all equally in need of salvation. We're all equally unable to enter heaven on our own righteousness. So only if you are talking about everyone being equally pathetic, even the rich, famous, and look at me, look at me people are in fact, in God's eyes, even more pathetic than the person who knows they're pathetic. You know? But that's the only point at which all human beings have something in common, really. And that's where he meets us. That's part of acknowledging your sin is, is where you actually wake up to the fact that you're not special. And, there, and you're not perfect and you're not anything. That apart from him, you're just another sinner. That's all. We're supposed to have the same attitude when we're dealing with people. You should never look down on anybody because the, but for the grace of God might you be isn't it? 
So we're supposed to be humble and, and happy to sit with the least person. You know? I always used to sit right down the front at church with all the street people. And people used to say, oh, you have such a good ministry. And I go, what ministry? Oh, you always, we see that you always go and you always sit with those people who come in off the street. You know, druggies and all sorts of strange people off Cuba Street and that. I'd always go and sit with them. And I'd laugh and they'd say, why are you laughing? He says, I'm not down there doing ministry. I'm down there because that's where Jesus would sit. So I'm sitting by him. And they go, what? And I just go off laughing, thinking you don't get it, do you? They didn't. No. You should be happy to associate with the least person. The least person. Because if you want to be where Jesus is, that's where he'll be. You know? Not like in, you know, uh, a high Anglican church or Catholic church or whatever, where you're kissing the bishop's ring or something, treating some people as, you know, special. Oh. What's the truth then? What is the real command? If this isn't it, it sounds like it, but it isn't it. What is the real command? You'll see it there in Luke 10. Who wants to read that for us? Luke 10, verse uh, 25 to 28. Diane, do you want to have a burst at that? Can you read that all right? Yeah. Um, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, first love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And second, love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, one first, two, oh, first secondly, secondly yeah. and you will live. Okay, what's missing here? Is this in that? It is. Well, what's missing now? The first. The first. This is number two. <clears throat> Who's the author of this? This is, this is the enemy. This is Antichrist in the church. If you want proof of that, do you think only the church is buying this message at the moment? Who else is buying this church? Are buying this message everybody even the people that hate Jesus and hate religion and hate Christianity are all preaching this isn't that a bit weird how could you make something that God said acceptable to people that hate God will you just give it a twist so it's no longer quite exactly what God said how do you do that you give them the second half with the first half missing. Because the command has two parts. What's the first part? Love God. Then, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? And I used to, when I was counseling, people would say, you know, you need to love others as you love yourself, but we're sitting with a a building full of people that don't love themselves you know well I wouldn't want to be their neighbor because you know the people that wanted to commit suicide and that they were you know hated themselves so if you only if you love your neighbor as they love themselves their neighbors in big trouble really so this is actually a three-phase thing why would I love God first remember it's that word agape that's the word that appears in the scripture. What's special about agape love? No it's to do with? No it's no emotion. Nothing to do with emotions. Why would God specifically say agape him? Are you supposed to filio him as well? Filio is like the love of friendship, the emotional one. Are you supposed to filio God as well? Yeah. But that's not the priority. Why does God leave emotion out of it? Has anyone in the room got emotions? Yep. And if you put your emotions, even today, think about today, or think about a work day, 
If you put your emotions on a graph, like a, like a temperature chart, what would the graph look like? And for some people, it's like, and then, you know, all over the place. So if you are basing eternity on something that won't sit still for 10 seconds, you know, if you are basing, if you want a foundation that won't stay still, just try running your life on how you feel. Just try having your faith depend on how you feel. Try running your marriage on how you feel. It will be disastrous. Really. You should agape God. You should agape your spouse. That way, even when you don't feel that you love them, you will love them because it's a decision that you don't change, even when you don't feel like it. Then 10 minutes later, you feel like it because your emotions are always doing this. Never let emotions drive. You know? They just need to be the passenger. Why love God first? Because this is where you learn. Just look down, we won't read it out too much because you guys should know this, but see in the next box here, John 14 and John 15, you all know this one hopefully off by heart now, where Jesus explains to them that the one who loves him is the one that keeps his instruction, which presumes that you know what his instruction is. Filio comes naturally, eros comes sadly too naturally, that's like, you know, lust. Agape has to be learnt. You have to know what the truth is. You have to know what agape is before you can do it. You have to know God as he reveals himself before you can agape him. And to love God, Jesus just tells us what that means. Obey his commands. If you obey my commands, you are my friend. That's what he says. If you want to remain in my love, keep my commandments. That's what he says. If you want the Holy Spirit, it's the same. He says, if anyone loves me, I will send a helper to them. But if they don't love me, they won't have the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit's dependent on that. Okay. That's why it's first. Who should be the first? But this is where you learn. So in your relationship with God, coming to know him, you learn how to agape. The first person you should apply it to, your first customer, should be yourself. You should, and if you're wondering what that means, is you should agree with him about yourself. Slow to anger, quick to forgive, always calling for repentance, always calling for Christ-likeness. That should be your attitude with yourself, especially when you mess up understand loving yourself having learned how to in the first relationship agree with him about you now that you're doing it in that relationship this relationship why would you then have a different style in this relationship should just be the way you roll therefore your neighbor is lucky because what you learned here apply first here rubs off there for your neighbor that's why God put it in that order but if you just obliterate this then however whatever you think love is and the reality is most human beings have no idea what love is especially if they're from a like an unsettled background or a broken family or something statistically most New Zealanders are a mess I don't know about the Philippines, but certainly here, most New Zealanders are a bit of a cop case. One way or the other, there's so much domestic violence, so many single parents, so much of that. Most people's perception of love is really, really, really distorted, which is why they don't treat themselves well, which is then why they don't treat anyone else well. So if you only preach this, you are presuming that people know what that is, but they don't. But people in the church don't want to hear this because the church 
is promoting this and people want to believe that their leaders and things know what they're talking about and sadly mostly they don't what if you are sent into a situation like that or what if you're sent by God to someone who is only hearing this and you're trying to fill in the blanks and they won't listen to you how long do you keep trying this is what our topic's about and the reason I started here is this is everywhere now this is going to get a bigger 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 problem when it says love the God with all your heart soul and strength oh sorry your heart your soul your strength and your mind why does why is it broken up like that heart and soul go together how would you love God with all your heart and soul what's one word that you could put there it's passion so with zeal you know so this is a the slightly emotional bit so you should have you should be zealous in your love for God you should love him with your spirit your heart you know the mushy bit of you but not that only then with all your strength what is strength about how do you love God with your strength what do you use strength for? For? Everything. Everything, every... Work. Everywhere. It's what you do. Strength is to do with doing. So with your, the mushy bit of you, you know, your spirit, your heart, the, your strength, meaning your actions, you know, how you actually apply love in your actions, and the last is mind why because agape is mostly about truth love him according to what he says love is knowledge so the three things that's what he says you need it all why because you didn't need to be able to do that yourself so that when your neighbor you know when you rub off on other people hopefully you're reflecting your Father in Heaven and your Lord to them. Can anyone tell me a classic fo um, love catastrophe that happens so often with young people where they think they're loving their neighbour but actually they are ruining them? What would that be? I win! I can think of about 50 of them. I win. Can anyone give me an example? No? I'll give you a classic from when I was young. We even had phones then, you know, cars, everything. <laughs> when I had a lot of friends at school who were girls, and most of them are really attractive, and then you get the guys hanging around, and they'd always be wanting to try and sleep with them. And the girls would be saying, oh, I really love this guy, you know, but he... Uh, their girlfriends their best friend would be the one saying to them oh well if you really love him is are they loving their friend no no they're setting themselves up they're setting their friend up for disaster it's a false love they think that by you know supporting their decision and you have your right to choose and never mind what your mum thinks and they think they're being a good friend they think they're being they're, they're just effectively they're cursing that person that's the example that leaps to my mind because I saw it so often do you understand why this on it's in isolation that's what they think they're doing because they don't know what this means if you were going to reflect your father in heaven in that situation and you're the best girlfriend what are you going to say He's going to tell him the truth about that's not love. He doesn't love you. Love gives, doesn't come to steal. You know, etc., etc., etc. Hopefully, that person will listen to you. But even if they don't, at least you have actually loved your neighbour. Hmm? Just turn over. Antichrist is behind this because if you are getting the whole world and most of the church to agree 
that the only thing that matters is that you just love and accept everybody, where does that end up once you've got most of the planet buying into that? Remember the, from the movie last week? Where does that end? It ends where anyone that doesn't agree is the enemy. Who won't agree with that? The Christians won't agree with that. Antichrist will sell this message in the church and outside of the church until if you don't go along with it, you'll be the problem. You'll be the problem. And I'll get to where Muslims and Christians and Buddhists and atheists and everything will all hold hands and sing Kumbaya together and have world peace and toast marshmallows. You know, because Antichrist will have the power to bring world peace about. So long as you all just hold hands and you all just accept each other and there's no judgment and blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, it all sounds great, doesn't it? How long does it last? It tells you in the Bible. How long does this peace last? Three and a half years. Three and a half years until the whole world is completely on the hook, with one exception. Those annoying, annoying Bible-believing people who won't go along. That's what all the persecution is about for Christians at the end. You're persecuted because even in the church, you are considered weird, a problem, because you won't just go along with what's not true. But everyone else will. At three and a half years, anyone know what happens? It's in the book of Daniel. Antichrist is the one that breaks the treaty. He starts the trouble by attacking Israel. At three and a half years is where the tribulation turns into wrath, where God starts pouring out his wrath. You don't want to be around then. How can you not be around then? It's only, if you're alive at that time, there's only one way you can not be there. Two thirds of the world's population will die. So right now, that would equate to about 6 billion people will die in the next three years. 6 billion people in three years. And most of the earth becomes uninhabitable. So you don't want to be around then. You certainly don't want any investments in real estate then, I can tell you. How can you avoid that? There's only one way. How can you avoid that? by having already become really his disciple because where are the disciples when that happens? Gone. The beginning of that kicks off with the rapture of the saints. We're here for tribulation, not for wrath. You know, so we go through the beginnings of it, the troubles, but when it switches over, God takes us away first. Otherwise, no one would survive. So all this is pretty important. This is where this message is going. That's where it ends. You know, the hold hands, love everyone, sing kumbaya and toast marshmallows. It sounds great. That's a lie. What tells you from your experience that it can't work? What if I just took 500 people randomly and made you all live on a little island for two years and you couldn't leave. How peaceful would it be, you think? If, assuming you had, you know, enough food and enough water, but maybe not excess. How peaceful will it be? Everyone's shaking their heads. What tells you it won't be great? Why? Yeah, because human beings are selfish. We are not great singers of kumbaya or toasters of marshmallows. Real human beings are selfish, mean, and frankly, pretty nasty. You understand? This is an illusion. They're selling a lie. 
the reality is no peace based on humanity has a prayer of working. You know the British Army, guess how many days since 1900, guess how many days the British Army has had off where no one in the British Army is holding a loaded gun somewhere being shot at. From 1900 till now, guess how many days off completely the British Army's had? One day in the 1960s. Why? Because humanity cannot stop doing evil. So the British Army has been defending somebody from being killed somewhere on the planet every single day since 1900, bar one. Humans are nasty. You understand? Next thing is this idea of perseverance. We are told that we should persevere, that we should love all the time, that we should lay down our lives, we should do all these things, right? What limit is there on how far you should go trying? That's our topic. So you would imagine that this idea of persevering must come into it, right? What does persevere mean in plain English? If I persevere, I... I keep on trying, isn't it? So it's got something to do with not stopping. You know, just keeping on trying, keeping on trying. So the scripture tells us we have to persevere. And the problem for a lot of people is they don't know when to let go because they confuse the command to persevere with the idea that you must just keep trying, keep trying no matter what. So we need to find out if that's true. Because if it is true, then we all need to get going and, you know, keep trying, keep trying. Have a look at what Jesus says in Matthew 24. I'll put, I might read this. I'll have to put my glasses on there. Jesus says that in the last days, you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love, that's the agape, of most will grow cold. That means it will die. Their love will die. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. What does that tell you, if you were just summarizing that, what, what does that tell you is going to happen? You have to stand firm to the end, right? You have to persevere. This is the trick. Persevere at what? Yes. The way to understand it is what else it says in the same passage. What's going to happen with most people in the church, according to this? They're going to go cold. Their faith will end. In context, the persevering is about persevering in your faith. It's not about persevering in your social work or your ministry or whatever. It's, and remember these relationships? It's actually about making sure you persevere here. In your love with God and yourself. So this has to persevere. Because the time is coming where you can't do this. Why? Because the people you're trying to do that with are going to be wanting to kill you. They won't listen to you, but then they'll go beyond not listening to you. They want to kill you. Even in the church. It says there that your, your enemies will be the members of your own house. What does that mean? 
Well, for lots of people, it means your own sister or your own father or whatever because lots of people are the only Christian in their family, you know? So when Antichrist starts to dominate humanity, he's dominating them. They will parrot him. They will reflect him. And he'll be saying, the, only, the world's going to be great. We've only got one problem left, and that's those Christians. They'll turn on you. So sometimes it means your actual family. But it has a more important meaning. What is your real family if you're a Christian? Jesus says, don't call anyone on earth your father. You have one father and he is in heaven. Who is that? God. If you're a Christian, your primary family, your primary family is what? The body of Christ. Not just church, the organization, but that collective thing, which is all the brothers and sisters on the planet who are really his disciples. That's your primary family, right? But church is bigger than the body of Christ because in any church are also people who are just religious, who are not disciples. They will follow Antichrist. They will follow, and when they follow, who will be the biggest group in most churches? Who will be the biggest group? The disciples or them? Them. So church will become dangerous for disciples. What tells you that's true? Who is our life modelled after? Who goes first as the pattern for us? Jesus. Who persecuted Jesus? The Romans? The Romans largely were completely indifferent to him. Who persecuted him? Who couldn't wait to kill him? The Pharisees and their followers. Why? What made them hate Jesus so much? The truth. Why? What did the truth mean to them? What did the truth include that they didn't like? You guys are fake. You guys are leading the people to hell. You guys say you are God's priest, but you are not. How did that go down? <laughs> like a lead balloon. What was their response? Repentance? No. Shoot the messenger. You know? The same thing happens at the end. The children of the Pharisees still are the largest group up to now in any church. And it gets worse and worse until globally, most of the so-called Christian church, it doesn't matter what denomination you're talking about, it won't make any difference, will be hand in hand with Islam and the Buddhists and the New Ages and everybody else in the global thing that is the end times church of Antichrist, right? There'll still be churches, but they'll be in this just love everyone mode, where you'll call, I'll call myself a Christian, and Holly will call herself a Buddhist, and you'll call yourself a, I don't know, follower of picking daisies or something rather. But we'll all respect each other, and we'll all say that all these roads all lead to God, and we're all going to heaven, and blah, blah, blah. Everyone will be happy, except in the Christian churches, they'll be aware of this group that aren't going along. The false Christians will be the most dangerous people to you on the planet. Just as they were for Jesus, just as they were for the disciples. How did Paul come into the story? Where's the first time you see Rabbi Shaul in the gospel story? What's he doing? He's running around arresting Christians and having them imprisoned and beaten. Isn't he? And why is he doing it? Because he's a good rabbi. He's serving God. He's trying to get rid of these heretics until God wakes him up, of course. That's a picture of what happens. Jesus says that when they do this to you, they will believe that they are serving God. 
exactly like Paul. You understand? That's why we need to be able to persevere even when persevere in our faith even when the relationships with other people are <coughs> at a deadly stage where you don't have a friend. Because what's a normal human reaction? Everything starts going bad, you're in a church and you're trying to stand up for the gospel and everyone around you is not interested and everyone around you wants you to agree with you know, whatever the message is. And you know it's wrong. There's no way you're going to agree because you know it's just rubbish. But nothing you do makes any difference. And now they're picking on you. What's the normal human reaction? Quit. That's what humans do. When it looks like there's no hope, what's the point? You start that all that self-talk. Oh, what's the point? Blah, blah, blah. That's what this going cold is about. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will go cold. Most people will go, oh, I had enough of this. The whole thing must be rubbish. I'll just bin it. Just forget it. It's, what, it's going to happen. The only ones that get saved are those who resist that temptation and understand what's happening is just what Jesus said. Therefore, even though there's nothing you'll be able to do about those relationships with other people, because once they're in the grip of Antichrist, nothing you say to them is going to make any difference. So you won't be able to fix it. The only thing you'll be able to do is to not throw... If I say throwing the baby out with the bathwater, are you familiar with that saying? So you won't do that. You'll throw out church... If you're in a church like that, you know, you'll throw out church, but you won't throw out Jesus. You'll be able to discern the difference between the false church and the real saviour. Most people won't do that, though. They'll throw the whole lot out and die. It requires that you have a real faith to begin with. You have to have that real relationship to begin with, which, of course, is never going to happen if you're in a church that's just teaching this, isn't it? Because that real relationship is born and grows in that first part of the commandment, love God first. Has anyone ever had a Christian conversation with someone from somewhere like Arise or those kind of places? Have you ever tried to have a really scriptural conversation? They look at you blankly. They haven't got a clue what you're talking about. You know why? They don't preach, they don't teach anything. They just sing songs and talk about love and toasting marshmallows or whatever. But they don't actually teach really next to anything about the real biblical God. They don't know him. So when the heat comes on, what's going to happen? They're just going to flake. They've got no real relationship with a real God, the person of Jesus Christ, to fall back on. Their religion is just hanging out with their friends at church at like a little, you know, Christian rock concert. Really serious. Jesus says we have to preach the gospel of the kingdom. What's the gospel of the kingdom? Here's a clue. Where does it appear in the scripture? Here in Matthew 24. What's he talking about in Matthew 24? What happens at the end? We are supposed to preach this. He says that we are to preach the gospel of the kingdom. In other words, we are supposed to tell people what's going to happen and what follows. Why? Well, primarily in, within the church so that people are not caught off guard. If you know what's going to happen and then it happens, you're not surprised. It's still awful, but you're not surprised and you end up giving up because you go, oh, I know what this is. This is just what Jesus said will happen, so I know what to do. I still won't like it. It'll still be horrible, but I know what to do. But if you don't know the gospel of the kingdom, if you only know peace, love and happiness and, you know, sin kumbaya, 
you won't have a clue what's going on. You'll think it's all over and you'll th you throw your faith out and Jesus out and die. That's why we're doing like we do. We, we need to understand ourselves so we can share it to other people. Do you think the world is vaguely conscious that the end is close? I think they kind of do know. You look at Hollywood, the kind of movies they make. All of a sudden, there's all these kind of apocalyptic movies like the world ending, and they'll say it's to do with global warming or something like this. But it's like deep down, even the worst of sinners can kind of sense that there's an end, that it doesn't just go on and on. You know? So they, you know, they're making up all sorts of things to explain it. They don't really, they don't understand. But something in them senses that there really is an end and that it might be closer than you'd like. Hence, be able to share about the coming kingdom, what will really happen, and what you need to do. So well, hopefully we'll major on that a bit. Page three. This perseverance thing, maybe I'll just shoot through those quickly. Let's see where it appears. James 1, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised those who love him. So to have eternal life, what should you expect? Trials. Is it just that you have trials and then you automatically inherit the kingdom? What is it about trials according to James? Having stood the test, what does that mean? You didn't throw Jesus out. You, re you understood what was happening to you. That God is, when it says trials and testing, it's like being purified. God puts you under pressure to make the ugly bits fall off. You know, it's like refining something in the fire. That's why God, what God uses trials for. It drives you, a smart person runs closer to Jesus under trial, a dummy runs away. So trials are designed to sanctify you. So having stood the test, meaning in other words, you embrace the trial and, and allowed it to you know, really grow you in Christ, then God will give to those people what he's promised in the covenant, eternal life and everything that goes with it. 1 Timothy 4, this is Paul giving instruction to Timothy. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. He means the scriptural truth. Because if you do, what does if mean? It means it's conditional. If you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So what else do we have to persevere in? The truth. Why is that important? Because the church around you is already given that up. It's not that they will given it up. They've already given it up. Most churches you go to, if you hear a straight gospel message from the scripture, run up and hug the guy at the front. It's a miracle. You know, mostly you just get some prosperity message or whatever, but not anything to do with what the scripture says. Persevere in the truth. Hebrews 10. Remember those early days after you'd received the light when you endured in the great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison. By the way, that doesn't just mean criminals. It means those who were imprisoned for their faith. And joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Got the idea what perseverance is? It's not quitting being his disciple regardless of the external situation. Whether it's happy times, sad times or trying times, 
particularly when the enemy is trying to take your faith off you. And the enemy will come usually in the guise of false Christians. That's why he warns us. So we know these things in advance. You won't be caught out. Then Matthew 10, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves be on your guard. It's a bit more, that, which is a bit much for us today, but we'll down the bottom it says, the one who stands firm, in other words, perseveres to the end, will be saved. And then note what it says in 23. When you are persecuted in one place, do what? Just pig-headedly stay there and keep fighting? What's he say? Flee to another. The big problem for a lot of Christians of my era is the church is used to preach all this, we call it triumphalism. Yeah, because Jesus has triumphed, that we should be like this invincible army. You know, Satan should just run away from us and we should just be able to go like an icebreaker through the ice. That's not what Jesus taught at all. So when he says you're going to have to flee in some circumstances, it sounds like defeat. It sounds like you know, what happened to sharing in his triumph and all that? It's hard for people of my era in church to contemplate the idea that I should have to back off. But this is his word. When should I flee according to this? When I'm persecuted. What does he tell me to do? Give up? No, move myself. Can anyone take a wild guess why? Why would God not want you to just stand there fighting, fighting, fighting to the death where you're being persecuted? Why would he say, move? When I tell you the answer, you'll kick yourself because it's really simple. Anyone have an idea? I should say that once in a while, God will give someone the grace to just stand to the death for a testimony like Stephen the Martyr. But that is the exceptional case. The ordinary case is this. Why would he not tell you to just stand fighting, fighting, fighting? Yes, you're on the right track. When that kind of persecution comes that he's talking about, even if Jesus was standing there in person, they would be persecuting him. How do you know? Because they did. And are you greater than the Messiah? That's the bit I said you kick yourself, it's obvious. Remember he sets the example for us? Jesus regularly had to leave, remember? He'd say something, they'd all get up and they'd want to stone him, whatever. What did he do? He left. Every time. They couldn't stone him, they couldn't hurt him, but he left. Why? Because he knew there was no point talking and he'd given them the truth and then there's no point beyond that because their hearts are too hard so if he stayed there another week, month, year 10 years, 100 years those people will make any difference meanwhile someone down over here who will hear is not hearing because you're still locked in this wrestling match with the deaf, you understand so that's why he says we get to that point you should move what your ministry somewhere else. It's not running away, just relocating. Really important to understand. Maybe not so much, I don't know if you guys are different, but lots of people I know like me, we hate that. It feels like giving up, you know, just goes against the grain. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to punch them. Because sometimes you think that's the ministry that they need is a good bop on the nose, but sadly that's not in the toolbox. Now, you'll see at the bottom of page three, I said, I put it there in that paragraph, the same sort of people that hated Jesus and demanded his crucifixion because he exposed them by his testimony as false will hate and want to get rid of the disciples of Jesus for doing the same thing. 
there's a point at which you will run into the children of the Pharisees and they'll be just like their ancestors. So you could be telling the gospel truth. You'll be trying to save them and they will just want to crucify you. You have to understand that you're not greater than your master. If he walked away, you walk away. Okay? Let's shoot over to... Next page. Let's just have a look at these scriptures here on the top of page 4. Romans 5. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. What does that tell you? While you're at your worst, God loved you. Jesus laid his life down for you before you even knew he existed. Right? Hence, who do you have a right to exclude from Christianity? You're an attempt to save. No one. You think, oh, but he's too bad. Not in God's eyes. You're as bad as him, apart from Christ, in God's eyes. That's what this means. God loves his creation, and he would save all of it if he could. But they have to be willing. If anyone says, who's going to end up in heaven? You know what the, the real, truest answer is? Those who want to be there. Most people don't. To want to be there, you have to do it on God's terms, remember? So God would like to have everyone go to heaven, but most people will not agree to his terms, so most will not go. Next one. Matthew 9. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. What's Jesus primarily concerned with then? Good people or bad people? Bad people. His primary concern is the worst people. So again, we shouldn't sit there on a high horse thinking, oh yes, I'll just only be worry about, you know, righteous people, my righteous friends, and we won't talk to those, you know, people over there. That's not Christ-like. Christ-like people are concerned with the worst of people. Understand? Last one, Ezekiel 33. Son of man. Ezekiel is the only other person other than Jesus referred to as son of man in the scripture. Ezekiel is a major foretype of Messiah the second coming. Most of Ezekiel is about the second coming. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I, na I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Therefore, turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? What God, what's God's attitude? I'm going to throw everything evil into the lake of fire, but I will take no pleasure in it. I would rather that you repented. Because people have this idea that God is just looking for a way of tripping you up. You know, hoping that you'll fail so he can send you to hell. It's the other way round. His own righteousness won't let anything evil into heaven. Because he's promised that in heaven, those who've suffered here will not suffer. Why? Because he won't let evil in there. To cause them to suffer ever again so he can't let wickedness into the kingdom to come therefore everything that won't come has to go into the lake of fire rubbish pit basically but does he like that no that's what he's saying i have to do it but i'm not gonna like it i take no pleasure in it i would rather that you all repented that's his attitude we have to have the same. It's like a reality test. We can't be sentimental. We have to want everyone to be saved, but appreciate that most won't. We have to realize that without repentance, they won't be saved. But we don't say, oh, well, stuff them then. No, we have to agree with them that if we can 
convince them to repent, we should try. You know, because he wants them to repent, we should want them to repent as well. But it has to be balanced with that like reality check, same as he says there. That in the end though, if they won't turn, they're gone. Next. I'll leave, I'll leave most of page four for you to read at home. But you'll see halfway down it says the problem. What the church does, can anyone tell me what limit is there on God's love? Does God ever stop loving someone? No. What tells you that? Because Jesus came for sinners. While we're at our worst, he laid his life down for us. You can't get any worse than you were before you were saved. He loved you then. You're already better than that. Now, you know. So, God's love is eternal. What what isn't eternal? What doesn't just go on and on without limit? Well, the chance of salvation. This is what has a limit. It says in the scripture that God will not wrestle with man forever. Does God get angry? Yes. yes. But what's special about his anger? He takes forever to get there. He's very, 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 very slow to anger. But he gets angry. He's very, very slow to reach a point where he's had enough with a person or with a, a nation. But if they just continually refuse, there is a day when he arrives at that point where he has had enough. The problem is, you know what we're talking about, what the church has been preaching? You know, God is love, blah, 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 happiness and light. They confuse these things together. They think that because God never stops loving, therefore he'll never stop saving. They don't realize that you can actually go too far. You can be so resistant to him that he will stop drawing you. What tells you this from the ministry of Jesus? Remember, everything Jesus is doing is reflecting his Father in heaven. Who's the most wicked people in the gospel story? In the gospel story, who are the most wicked people? It's the Sanhedrin, right? Why are they more wicked than the Romans? The Romans have an excuse. They don't even pretend to know God. What's especially wicked about the Sanhedrin? They say they know God better than anybody else. So they have the least excuse of anyone for their wickedness. In fact, they have no excuse. Jesus tells them that. They're the most wicked, right? And did God know that they wouldn't repent? Yep. You already knew. So, of course, Jesus didn't bother giving them the gospel then, did he? Am I right? No. What did Jesus do? He gave them exactly the same gospel as everybody else. Probably with a slightly firmer tone, if you read it. You know, he's pretty blunt with them. But this is what you want you to understand. Even the Pharisees... He gave the same opportunity. He gave them the same chance as everybody else. And some of them believed, including Nicodemus. Remember? Some of the Pharisees believed him. And, became, and some of the first Christians were of the party of the Pharisees. So, some, but most, what they do? They hated that, they didn't like what he had to say about them, so they set out to kill him. Did he just keep trying with them? Did he just standing there arguing with them day on day on day on day? No. 
What about when he's crucified and resurrected and ascends to heaven? Does he stop trying to save them? Actually, no. This is where you have to know a bit about church history. He doesn't. He keeps trying. Where do you think the apostles preach the gospel most? In the temple and in the synagogues. The first preaching, the first evangelism continued to be to the Jews for 33 years, 34 years after he ascended, God continued to appeal to them to repent. He sent the apostles. What else did he send? What else did the apostles have that should have convinced anybody to believe? The power to do miracles. So it wasn't just that they were giving a good sermon. They demonstrated Christ through the things that he enabled them to do. Supernatural signs and wonders and confirming the word. Everybody else is getting saved. There's a massive growth in the church. But these dudes, they just dug their heels in deeper and deeper. Right? When the Romans persecuted the Christians, you know why? Because the Pharisees told them to. The Pharisees told the Roman rulers that the Christians were terrorists that were plotting to overthrow Caesar. Up until then, the Romans hadn't paid the Christians any notice, just as they hadn't paid Jesus any notice. It was the Sanhedrin that convinced Rome to, you know, when you hear about Christians being thrown into the Colosseum to be eaten by lions and all that stuff? It's the Sanhedrin that arranged that to try and exterminate this problem, get the Romans to do their dirty work. What did God do? Well, he used the Romans to get rid of the Sanhedrin instead. AD 70, what happens? Six legions of the Roman army turn up and they burn Jerusalem to the ground and they kill all the priests. The whole Sanhedrin is put to the sword by the Roman army. The temple was destroyed. All of this, gone. What happened to the chance of salvation? It ended. God gave us that as a picture to understand that he will persevere and persevere and persevere until there's a point where he knows that that person will never repent but they have no excuse they had the same chance as everybody else they received the gospel they just rejected it you understand we have to be really clear on this in our minds because you can be in that situation where God will send you to someone and you really know he sent you and you will give them the truth and you'll give them the truth and you'll do everything until you go nearly crazy thinking, what else can I say? What else can I do? And they just laugh. Do you just keep going your whole life on this futile mission? You have to understand that God himself doesn't do that. There's a point at which they have no excuse. They are not ignorant. They have decided to reject him. Now, turn to page five. How long then will God give you the grace to keep trying? Well, the simple answer is until he knows that that person has heard. You've done your part. The message is really delivered. You know, all you can do is just repeat yourself. When that is the case, he won't generally give you the grace to hang in there your ability to stay will vanish. 
that's how he gets you to leave. When he wants you there fighting, you'll have his grace to do that. He like empowers you to testify. When he decides it's time to quit, all of a sudden, all that zeal and ability you had to keep going will just vanish. And even if you try again, it's just, you'll get beaten up. You know, you'll just know that he's not there in it with you anymore, that he's left. So you either stay there and keep getting beaten up or you leave with him because if he's left, there's no point being there. Does that make sense? I know it's an odd thing to say because we, we're taught because the love of God doesn't end, it gives this idea that he'll never stop trying. It's not biblically true. Once a person has had the gospel and they really have had that same chance, if they keep on rejecting it, there really is a point where he'll say, don't invest anything more in that person. Does that mean they'll never get saved? What do you think? Is it then impossible if you failed, not that it's really you that's failed, but if everything you did didn't do it, does that mean that's it, curtains for them? What else could happen? What do you think is stopping them? It's usually pride and belief in themselves. And if that's like a steel door that you can't get past, what will God do if he still wants to try and save them? What's, the, what's left to him to do? Well, he gets you out of the way. And then he'll send a giant wrecking ball <laughs> swinging through their life. Until they're just a little smear on the ground going, help me. And then he goes, okay, ready to repent now? If they're lucky. You know? So that's the other thing to consider. Just because of what he had you do didn't succeed it's still with the planted seeds entirely up to him whether he does or not but it's not beyond him it's not beyond scriptural possibility that he will simply escalate things once you're gone for their good of course you know to bring them to repentance but he'll want to do that himself so it's not you know we don't do that he does now, on the bottom of page five, there is this dual enemy. I've said denial, the great enemy. There is a natural thing in us <laughs> that called denial. If I'm in denial, what am I, what am I doing? If I'm in denial, what am I doing? I'm avoiding the truth, aren't I? I am knowingly or unknowingly holding on to some kind of illusion in order to not have to deal with the truth. So has anyone, can you, anyone remember being in denial? When is the most common time for human beings to be in denial? Because this is healthy and normal. There's a normal and healthy thing where every human being is always in denial, at least for a period. What's that? Yes, when someone dies. It's part of the grief cycle. So that diagram, which I'm sorry it's not very good, but let me just, if this is your mood, you're up and then let's use Jason's example and somebody dies, you go to the funeral. Someone that your whole life revolved around. You can't cope with it all. It's too much. You, you're, you would implode at that point. So what your brain does is it pretends it hasn't happened. So at some level, you know they're dead because you went to the funeral. But at some other level, you almost pretend they're still there somehow, you know? You don't quite let the truth arrive in one hit because you can't deal with it. So denial is always, always the first 
stage of grief. Then your mood though sinks. Somewhere along here you get all these negative things like anger, frustration, why? What's the problem with denial? Yeah, what's, so the problem with denial is right next door is the reality of the truth. Denial is, has a some effect, but the problem is you are still standing in the middle of the reality. And this collision between how you want it to be or how it is in your denial and the reality is like going like this and people get frustrated and angry and like this and their mood goes now if people will never do anything about moving towards embracing the truth what do you think this line goes to often especially in New Zealand Often this goes to a second funeral. There's. This is the cause of lots of suicides. You know the suicide rate in New Zealand has at an all time high? And it's been going up year on year for the last five years. They don't have any idea, but I would say it's also going in parallel with us becoming a secular nation that has no answers for anything. So people get angrier and angrier and angrier and they get frustrated because they, they're trying to think of a reason why it's okay but it's not okay and the mind starts fighting with itself. This is if someone dies. Now, what happens if this is abuse? And the most extreme case that I used to have to deal with like every week when I was in social work would be uh, someone being molested as a child in their own family by a member of their own family, which is the most common thing. What, what role do you think denial plays in that? What if your own dad, what if you're like a 12 year old girl and your old dad, your own dad is making you have sex with him? and telling you not to tell mum and then he starts to tell you that it's happening because it's your fault it's not him it's your fault this is always what happens it's a standard pattern right so you're to blame you're the victim but you're to blame apparently according to him what role do you think denial has well nothing in you what are you supposed to expect from your dad? The exact opposite, right? You expect that he should protect you and all these things instead of this, right? So what happens for those people is war breaks out in their own psyche between how it should be and how it is. And they don't want to believe that their dad is this monster. So they start making excuses for him and the more they make excuses for him not wanting to believe that he's a monster if it's the more they buy into when he says it's your fault so in the end they can reach where they actually believe it's their fault that he's innocent and that they are the cause and he's the victim that's when it often ends in suicide they will literally self-destruct right but abuse doesn't have to be sexual abuse. You can have spiritual abuse. And this is what happens to people. This is the part that you need to be aware of. This is what happens in churches where people have wide-eyed and innocently expecting that this is my church family and we all love God and everything, not understanding that most of the people in your church don't. And something like purpose driven or promise keepers or the Toronto thing that you know I hate so much comes along 
And those people can see, because they're really Christian, they can see that it's not of God, therefore it's a threat to their neighbour, it's a threat to their family. So they put their hand up and they tell the truth. What happens to you when you tell the truth in a place that doesn't like the truth? What happens when the leaders who've been promoting this dangerous thing hear you telling them that it's dangerous and you need to stop? What do you think happens? That situation is the same as what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. You're the leaders, but you're dangerous. You're the leaders, but the people aren't safe under you. You're the leaders. If you don't repent, God will have to replace you. Otherwise, these sheep under you are doomed. Most people are not saying it as bluntly as that, but that's how it's received by the leadership. How dare you challenge me? How dare you tell me I'm teaching a lie? Blah, blah, blah. Right? So what do you think the leadership usually does? They do exactly what the dad raping his daughter does. If you're suffering, it's your fault. We're innocent. If you don't fit in here, if you're having a bad time, that's all about you, not us. You get exactly the same mechanism that destroys that 12-year-old girl, starts kicking off in real Christians who've put their hand up and just told the truth in false churches. If they're not conscious of this, they'll end up like that girl, believing somehow they are the problem. But when they go to their Bible and they try and work it out and they try and find what the leaders are saying in their Bible, they can't find it. Every time they look, they find the thing that they said. A war starts between whose God is God? My pastor's God or the God in my book? You know? And in the end, the brain can't take it and it reaches a thing called ambivalence. And ambivalence is what you and I would call where they just go numb. And they just can't feel anything anymore. You know? <laughs> like, like an awakening coma. Because literally their mind will explode because it can't reach a resolution. If nothing ever happens to bring the person out of that, they will die spiritually. It's because the leaders, just like that dad, are manipulating the victim with their words and their actions to what purpose? To their own self. It's their own denial. It's denial on the other side of the equation. They're in denial that what the person has said is true. They can't cope with the idea that they're the leader and that they've led the people into something demonic. So themselves, not wanting to accept the truth, they deal with it by trying to shoot the messenger. So you've got denial working on both sides of the equation. The ones who should be listening in denial and the ones who have spoken ending up in denial because they are because of what happens in response it's a, like a lose-lose situation and i've watched really good people have their faith crushed like a tin can by vicious false teachers who are just protecting out of pride just protecting their leadership their position and if they you know if someone was trying to tell them that the world's round not flat they would still insist it was flat rather than admit that they never could ever say anything wrong and they leave a trail of destruction behind them but that's happening everywhere in the church right if that's never resolved i believe this is the process that jesus is talking about that the love of most will grow cold it's what will kill their faith abuse from the false leaders if people don't know how to deal with it it will kill them by the way if somebody is manip manipulating you exercising their spiritual authority as a as a church leader to influence you for their own gain right that's manipulation 
So they're saying, I'm, I have the authority here, I'm the priest, I'm your, you know. And they tell you, you're not allowed to talk. The classic is the Catholic Church in America has spent nearly a billion dollars paying off or buying off victims of sexual abuse by priests, giving them money to shut up. But they can't shut up because it's the money doesn't fix their head. What they need is for the priest to confess. You know? It's manipulation. Does anyone know what the biblical word for spiritual manipulation of another person is? For selfish gain. Do you know what the Bible calls that? Witchcraft. That's what witchcraft is. Exercising spiritual power over another person to obtain your agenda. Witchcraft. That's what it is. When God looks at that behavior, it's witchcraft. Witchcraft in the church. And witchcraft has victims. Okay? Now, this is usually ends up in depression. And as Veronica will tell you, the hospital is the mental health system is full of people, but most of them don't have a mental illness. Most of them are depressed. Most mental health clients don't have any like underlying brain damage or anything like this. They are depressed to the point of being crippled. They cannot function as human beings. That's how depressed they are. Right, but there's nothing like mechanically wrong with their brain, most of them. If they can never get out of this, they will inevitably end up here. And here's the scary, scary thing. Remember I said this is a normal healthy thing? How long is that supposed to last, do you reckon? Let's go back to Jason's example. So someone close to you dies, the initial thing is always denial. How long is it supposed to last? How did God design it to work? Remember it's about not being able to deal with the truth all at once? So what should straight away start happening? You should start allowing the truth to sort of arrive over a short time. You know what I mean? You kind of let it arrive slowly, but arrive. You know, you let yourself deal with it as quickly as you can. So that's when it's healthy. So it acts like a buffer, sort of slows it down. So you get there, but it not don't not destroyed by it in the process. But for lots of people, this doesn't last like a week or a month or whatever. Sometimes this lasts like decades. Sometimes it lasts forever. They never let themselves face the truth. They never do. Or they just can't because the you know, the trauma is so great and there's no help or nothing, so they just stay locked in it, which means they end up depressed for life. And that's what the mental health system sees, people who are like virtually permanently on drugs, you know, to deal with what seems to be like a permanent condition because they're just stuck. All right? What's supposed to happen is you should start coming out the other side. They call it bargaining. But I'm just going to call it thinking. This happened because you delayed facing the truth. This turn happens when the depression is so horrible it seems less horrible to start slowly facing the truth. So you start doing eventually what you should have done over here. But when you're here, you can't think straight. What really needs to be in the picture for this to work? Because ultimately you break out again and it's like escape. Right? Yet past it. What's so often critical here? What don't you have when you're super depressed? 
or when you're in denial? What are you missing? You're not accepting it. What's really missing that you may not be able to give to yourself because you're in it? You're on the right track. You lose perspective. So you come to believe, it's like that 12-year-old girl, girl I'm telling you about, you come to believe that daddy's innocent and it's all my fault. You completely lose perspective. So your ability to grasp the truth vanishes. How are you ever going to get it back? That's what ministry is about. That's why I'm telling you. Because nine times out of ten, God has to send somebody to this person to start injecting perspective and truth to help them find solid ground under their feet in order to start standing up, in order to be able to start processing what they otherwise can't until they can finally get out, right? Why am I telling you about this? The, if this is a spiritual abuse situation and God's showing you that the leader's a loony or is just lying and you tell the truth and they won't listen and they start beating on you, what did Jesus say earlier? Remember, if you are persecuted, do what? Run. Why does he say run? Because if you stay, this witchcraft, this manipulation of you will start and it won't stop because it'll be, the leadership will be, it's you or me. They'll do anything to keep their position. And they won't care about destroying you. You understand? <coughs> to not have this happen to you when you're in that situation, <coughs> having told the truth, if you see that they will not listen, not that they just didn't understand. If they didn't understand, you try again till they do understand. But if you can see that they understand, and they still want you to shut up and they still want you to conform and shut your Bible and be quiet. If you submit to that, you'll end up here. Because spiritually, what's coming at you is from Satan. It's witchcraft. When you know you've told the truth, when you know they've heard it and they've chosen to not listen and they're trying to get you they're trying to turn the tables and make it that it's your problem and you should shut up and blah 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 make sure you understand this if you don't know to leave this will happen and I know people who are stuck here their faith is gone and they're just miserable you know one of my best friends like this and he's been in psych hospitals Every other, like every six months, he's readmitted. He's a total wreck. All done to him by church. You know? Really, really vicious. So your involvement is, if you're here, make sure the denial that will be a normal part of grieving, that you don't let it solidify. You know, it's a perfectly normal and helpful initial buffer, but you must be quite clear in your mind that you need to embrace the truth and work through it as quickly as you're able and to move on. And whether it's a, a grieving thing or some abusive thing, don't stay locked in battle with it when it's clear that it's not going to listen or this will happen. So that's if you're at this end. The other place that this if we need to understand this is sometimes God will send you to someone who's here and they'll be a real Christian who's usually here because they told the truth in a place that doesn't like people telling the truth. To get them out of here, someone will have to give them what they can't give themselves. That perspective truth putting the solid ground back under their feet so this is like a ministry thing right so if you understand that this is the ordinary grief cycle but it can freeze you know there are points at which it can just like lock and then the person's like instead of going 
through it, they get stuck. Hopefully, although that's a bit of a crash course. Does this make sense? And you can always ask for help, of course. Well, you should ask for help. You never try taking that on by yourself. But you might recognise it in people and recognise you know, where they are and what might be helpful to them to get them through. Or if you see someone just fighting, refusing you know, to back off and go, slowly going under, you can remind them. You know, there's a point at which God says go. Uh, which is the point of my talk, of course. Okay, let's shoot over to... You'd never want to underestimate how powerful that witchcraft is. It can be lethal. And on page 6, you'll see there, it says, is from 1 John 3, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Matthew 5, you've heard it said that a to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. The problem in English is it sounds like you're not allowed to ever be angry, doesn't it? It's not what it says. Remember, this is translated from Greek. In the Greek, it's clearer. Remember the Ten Commandments. You shall not bear false witness that is the foundation commandment for this instruction anyone who is angry or acts in hatred towards someone based on false testimony that's like the dad who treats his daughter in a hateful way as if it's her fault that he's doing this. That's what my told me. You know, that's what God says. Such a person is a murderer. It has a murderous outcome on the victim. It kills. It's to do with injustice. It's to do with the breach of trust. It's to do with a thousand things like that. It's spiritually murderous to hate someone illegitimately based on a lie it's not that you're not allowed to hate evil if you try and never hate you'll explode God hates things you're not greater than God you know hate what God hates hate evil hate lies hate injustice hate abuse hate all those things that is you are right and that is good and proper and godly to hate 1 Corinthians 13, love delights in the truth, agape, and hates evil, love hates. It's not what it's saying. It's about hating based on a lie. That is abuse. Right? And John says, anyone who does that is a murderer. Why? Well, just try being on the receiving end of it. Has anyone ever... What would you know? I don't know what Philippine schools are like, but my sister, right? My sister was real catty. Sure, she still is. But anyway, <laughs> um, my sister was just a, like an alley cat, you know, and she was Miss Popularity because she and her best friend were the two Barbie doll looking girls in the school. And all the guys were like swooning over them that. So they had felt this like really this power and they could pick and choose who they let be their friends and she would change friends more often than socks you know until next week when she would like rotate them over again and every time every day she'd come home she looked sour and go what's wrong with you oh that sounds i'm never talking to her again blah 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 until next week then it would be someone else's turn you know but if you're on the receiving end of that where you are being hated and being badly, being treated in an unchristlike way, but you're innocent, the damage to you is like the 12 year old girl scenario. Yeah. There's something especially wounding and especially crippling and especially harmful when you know you're innocent, but you are being 
ripped into as if you were guilty. And it's worse when it's coming from someone who's supposed to be someone who loves you. The most extreme example being the one I gave. So we are told that God, this is one of the no-go areas with God, we are never to do that. We're to be slow to anger, quick to forgive, deal in the truth. Agape delights in the truth. You know, you don't have to like everyone, you don't have to pretend that you like everyone, but acting hatefully based on... Why would you act hateful, hatefully with someone who's actually innocent? I've given you some examples, but what would your motivation be? Covering up. Covering up. It's, what, it's always the case. People do it to avoid dealing with the truth themselves. It's easier to shoot the messenger. You know? So it's nearly always some selfish motivation why they treat someone else hatefully, even though from a God's, God's absolute truth perspective, that person is not guilty. You become like a scapegoat for their problem. God hates that. Okay. Knowing that he hates that is very important for us because when we see it happening to us, you know, if you end up in that situation, like I was saying, where you've just told the truth somewhere and you're copying it because they don't want to deal with the truth, they'll try and tell you that, especially if it's in church, they'll try and tell you that God's on their side. Understanding this will ground you, keep you safe, knowing, <laughs> no, he's not. He's not on your side. He's on my side. Why? Because I've just told the truth. You're acting hatefully towards me just to cover up your own sin. That means he's definitely on my side. You're acting murderously towards me. You know how I learned about this? When I first spoke up about Toronto and the church? And I spoke up a lot. And then all of a sudden I had heart trouble, like physical heart trouble. My heart kept always stopping and I couldn't breathe and I was having nightmares and all sorts of stuff and I knew I was under some sort of really demonic attack and two people without me saying anything two people came up and said I was praying for you and I don't know why but God keeps saying something about murder well I knew I wasn't murdering anybody you know what I mean I didn't even have that intent toward anybody so I had to pray about it and he told me about this he was ex had two people come and make me aware that I was on the receiving end of like murderous spiritual attack coming from people who were praying against me you know praying that I would be silent why because the option was they would have to deal with what I'd said they would have to deal with the fact that they were promoting something that was demonic if you pray against someone, that's witchcraft. You know? You're sending something murderous. So I know what it's like to be on the receiving end of this. Not fun, but guess what? I'm still here. God's bigger. Page seven. So we're just going to deal with the one right at the top there. Wounded people, people who are wounded like this, need to understand two things. Usually when they're really, really wounded, it's because they've tried and they've tried and they've tried with a, a person or a group or a church to get them to come out of deception, come out of some crazy thing, and the person just won't. It has a little bit to do with that mechanism I said about the 12-year-old girl, girl eventually believing that the abuse is somehow her fault. It's really, really easy to think that the the, the reason the person hasn't repented is somehow your failure. You know, it's just human nature. It's really easy to slip into that where you think, oh, it's because I haven't tried hard enough or I haven't. You must be really realistic. If you know that you've given someone the truth over and over, if you know there's really nothing else you could say, then that's it. Don't let yourself fall into the trap of thinking that you are the Messiah. How many people 
Pat, how many people can you save? No one. That's it. Because you're a normal Christian. It's the same across the board. Same number as me. None. But it's easy to slip into this error. Easy. Because they'll be trying to convince you. Other people will be on your case. It's easy to think that it's somehow your fault that they're not saved. The best we can do is be his witness. What they do with the message is not your responsibility. There's a line. There's a line of responsibility. You can't cross over it. The only one who can do any saving is the Messiah. So unless you are the Messiah, as you should tell us now, then at best we are the postman. We can deliver the message, that's it. Okay, But lots of people fall into that first problem and they'll end up depressed cause, and frustrated because no matter what they try and they keep punching away, you know, try this, try that, and they can go on their whole life and just in the end they will just go down in flames believing that somehow this person is going to hell because they haven't done enough or something. Okay, so first thing, don't let that happen. Second thing that can be a real problem, especially if you're in a position where you're in a church or something like that, to which you're really loyal, or maybe like lots of my Salvation Army friends, they're like about fifth generation Sallies, so they couldn't imagine being in a different church. You know, they just couldn't imagine it. Or like in the Philippines, Catholic people it would never cross their minds to not be Catholic. Not because they especially believe the Pope, but because, well, we've always been Catholic. What else would we be? They don't realise that that's idolatry. That's, been an, that's making an idol of the organisation. There's no denomination that is God. None. They're all collections of human beings. God is himself. No church is God. But it's really, really easy to fall into idolatry of your church. So if your church goes off the, off the narrow path, one of the hurdles for people of leaving when God says leave is the sense of misguided loyalty that, well, how can I leave it? You know, it's that denial thing comes in. It's too big a shock to think that your church isn't Christian. But lots of churches now are not Christian at all. It's a real hurdle, but understanding that it's there will get you through. Understanding that eventually, if it's true, if the truth is your particular church, wherever they may be, has really left the narrow way, is no longer preaching the gospel, even if it used to. Like the Salvation Army doesn't preach the gospel anymore, but it used to. So people are staying loyal, because they say, oh yes, but you know, it used to do this and used to do that. You say, yeah, it used to, but the thing you belong to now doesn't it used to be christian but it's not christian now you need to get out you know so be cautious about that idolatry thing if that's your reason for hanging on it's a trap it's a snare and you'll end up at the bottom of that dip so to finish the power of these things to hold someone captive is unbelievably strong. The power of that witchcraft, the manipulation, is unbelievably strong. When I was counselling, I had, I've lost track of how many prostitutes who, to deal with their sh sense of shame about being prostitutes, were heroin users. So they go to work and then they come home feeling like so unclean. So to feel better, they'd stick a needle up their arm and fill themselves with drugs. And it's just like a vicious cycle. And then to buy more drugs, they'd have to go out being a prostitute to buy more heroin. So it just becomes like, you know. But about 90% of them had been abused as girls by a family member. But that message that they are dirty, it's your fault, you're making daddy do this, was so 
chiseled in their head. The, the power of that manipulation was so intense that they couldn't challenge it by themselves. They believed it. They believed that they were subhuman and that the only thing for them was just to be a prostitute because, you know, they could never have, they could never get married or anything like that. That was implanted in them, but in that abuse, but the power of it is unbelievable. And the only ones I ever saw escape it is when God did it. God broke the power of that because it's spiritual. It's witchcraft. You need the word to do that. Okay, so now we're just to finish, we're just going to briefly look at the word about these limitations. When should you stand? When should you run? Now, who who needs Ezekiel 34 explained? Do you remember? Have you all read that? I hope so, because I keep referring to it a lot. So the basic synopsis is. God had, there's all these sheep and they're these shepherds. That's a picture of people in the church and the, the shepherds are the pastors, right? God complains to Ezekiel that there's fat sheep and lean sheep. Can anyone tell me why are some sheep fat and some sheep lean? What's different in the character? The fat sheep are only thinking about their own stomachs. The fat sheep choose the shepherds. <coughs> They choose the shepherds that will just give them what they want. This is Ezekiel, right? What did Jesus say through Paul? A time is coming when people won't put up with sound doctrine, but they'll hire for themselves people who will say what they want to hear. That's the fat sheep. In this, so this is all about in the church, right? It says that the fat sheep gobble up all the resources. So everything in the church comes is catering to the fat sheep. What Do the fat sheep want difficult gospel? Do the fat sheep want to hear about awkward things like sexual abuse or anything else like that? They don't want to hear that. They don't want awkward things like, you know, grief cycles and the fact that people are going to hell. Oh, don't give me that. Give me, you know, a marshmallow toasting party and singing Kumbaya, I'll have that instead, thank you. So you don't hire me, you hire the other guy who's happy to just preach that. That's the fat sheep and the hireling shepherds. God explains to Ezekiel that what they do is they trample everything so that after they've eaten, there's nothing left to feed the other sheep. So the other sheep starve in that place. So in the, real, in the real world, it's like in a church where everything is catering to the people that don't want any solid food. So if you're a real Christian in a congregation like that, you will spiritually starve. Your faith will shrivel up in there. You'll starve to death. They also, it says, they also money the waters with their feet. And their feet is a reference to their lifestyle, how they walk. The water is a reference to what? Water is always a reference to the spirit. A muddy water is a dirty spirit. So the way they walk muddies the waters, means the only spirit in that place is unclean. It's not fit to drink. So the lean sheep not only can't get solid food, sound teaching, they can't get the Holy Spirit there either because every spirit in there is muddy water. Therefore, he says to Ezekiel, therefore, I'm going to send my own shepherd. And in John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd to a Jewish audience. We might not pick it up straight away, but he, to a Jewish audience, he's saying, I am the shepherd you're expecting. I am the shepherd Ezekiel said would come. So God said, I'll send my own shepherd and he'll do these things. He'll find all the lean sheep wherever they've been scattered because they end up being scattered away and abandoned and discarded by the fat sheep. No, the fat sheep don't care about them. So he says, I'll find them and I'll gather them and I'll free them and I'll heal them and I'll anoint their heads and I'll lead them where? Out. 
out of where? Out from the fat sheep. The real Jesus will always bring the real Christians out from amongst the false church. So again, rather than standing in an endless battle in some wrong place, if you're really a Christian, you should be expecting that Jesus will bring you out of there, not have you stand there forever. But also, we need to go back one in the chapter. Where have I put it? I think it's on the next page. Yes, page eight. And this is the one that you should really learn for yourself because it tells you what the limitations are. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, that's Ezekiel, speak to the people and say to them, when I bring a sword against the land and the people of the land choose one of their men to make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and he blows the trumpet to warn the people. So what that is, is someone in the church that God causes to see the danger coming, blowing the trumpet as he opens his mouth and warns. Okay, so that's what a watchman does. He warns of impending trouble. And if anyone hears the trumpet but does not hear the warnings, what have they done? They've heard it, so they've got no excuse. They heard, but they didn't do anything. If they do not heed the warning and the sword comes and takes their life, look what it says next. Their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet but did not heed the warning their blood will be on their own head if they had heeded the warning they would have saved themselves but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life that person's life will be taken because of their sin but i will hold the watchman accountable for their blood and then the rest of it just repeats that what what's he saying What's God's standard? Remember, this is his word. So this is like the reliable rule you can make decisions on. If you're warning someone, if you're trying to give them the gospel, if you're warning someone that their sin is going to set, you know, or if you're warning a church or an organization or something that if you don't get into that, don't, you know, where's your limitation? Blow the trumpet. That's it. If you know they've heard, if you blow it and they've heard, if you blow it and you don't think they've heard, blow it again. Blow it till you're sure they've heard. But the rule is, the watchman's only responsible for blowing the trumpet. Those who hear it are responsible for what they do when they hear it. God draws a sharp distinction. We are not responsible for what people do when we give them the gospel. God does not let you bear responsibility for their decisions. You might not think that's anything, but I promise you it will save your life if you're in a situation where someone's so close to you that you care about so much and you desperately want them to be saved and you've done everything and everything and everything and they just won't listen. If you don't understand this, you will drive yourself insane, feeling guilty that I should just, what if I do this, what if I do that? But when you reach the point where God is telling you, they've heard you, but they will not listen, you have to understand that they have to bear the responsibility for their choice themselves. Does that make sense? If you can't do that, you'll drive yourself la-la. God doesn't want that. Also, we've seen what Jesus said. When you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. That's his instruction. So nowhere does he say just, you know, fight some sort of martyr's fight to the death. When you know you've done everything that you can if it's still nothing and especially if they start persecuting you back you don't just have his permission to leave you have his instruction to leave okay so this is maybe that you're leaving a church but it's just just a situation maybe that you need to leave a situation 
or a relationship or something, you know? Then, in Titus 3, does it, who's read Titus? It's one of those books that never gets read, because it's so, ironically, because it's so short. People think it can't be important because it's only got like three chapters. Was it four? But anyway, it's so short, people usually just skip over it. It's actually really important. But in a nutshell, he's, Paul is warning Titus to make sure that you follow sound doctrine. The whole thing is about following sound doctrine, right? That if you let error come in, the whole place will be shipwrecked. People will go, you know, end up not going to heaven as a consequence. So look what he says. Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. Blah, blah, blah. Then this one here. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. In the church, if you speak up and say, but the Bible says... Guess what the church loves to do now? It's a favourite tactic. Oh, you're being divisive. And they'll quote this. And what they mean is, you are dividing people in the church. So some people agree with you and some people don't. And now the church is divided. You're a wicked person. We should have nothing to do with you. That's what they say. Is that what Paul was telling Titus? In context, what is a divisive person? In the context of the letter to Titus, Paul means someone who is trying to divide you from sound doctrine. A false teacher, in other words. Someone who comes in and causes quarrels and arguments, trying to divide you from the truth, have nothing to do with, warn them maximum two times, and then after that have nothing to do with them. If they won't listen after two warnings, throw them out of the church. But a divisive person is defined as someone who is trying to take you away from the actual scripture. If you're talking about dividing people, it can't mean that because the truth always divides people. The gospel is the most divisive thing there is. So Paul's not saying get rid of anyone who's divisive in that sense because he'd have to get rid of himself. In that sense, Paul would be the most divisive person that ever was, you know, other than Jesus. It doesn't mean that. It means those who try and divide you from the truth. So once again, the standard is warn, warn a second time. They still won't listen. You have God's complete authority to have nothing to do with that person anymore. You don't have to stand there in an endless wrestling match. You understand? What else do we need to know here? Right down the bottom. Revelation 18. So this is particularly important for the last days. There is a point where John hears another voice cries out from heaven. and says, come out of her, the her is Babylon. Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. There's a point at which if you stay in a wicked place that you know is teaching error, if because of misguided loyalty or some other things, if you don't obey God and leave, you're supposed to blow the trumpet, you're supposed to try and correct, but when you've done those things, if there's no response, if they're trying still to swing you around to agree with the error, the Bible's crystal clear, you must get out. Because if you don't, Revelation 18's warning applies. If you stay, you will share in their guilt. Remember when we did about the church of Laodicea? Hot and cold, a mixture, can't be a mixture. You know, you have to make your mind up. What are you? Are you really a disciple or are you just religious? Are you really a disciple or you just want to go with this crowd? 
you know everyone has, has to face that decision sooner or later there's a point at which God won't tolerate us not getting out because the stay will mean that we don't love him enough to take his side I think yeah page 9 is just personal to me because I wrote this for myself because you know I've been fighting up for the Sallies for I worked it out the other day 25 years 25 years and always God gave me the grace if you look at on page 9 Jeremiah there that's exactly what God said to me in 1993 he says go and say whatever I tell you to say and do not be afraid for them of them because I myself will rescue you they will attack you but I will rescue you that exactly happened he said to warn them about Toronto they wouldn't be warned Toronto came even after it came, I warned them, you have to repent. They won't repent. So after 25 years, I don't want to give up. I feel like I've invested my entire life in this project to get them. So I had to write this for myself because the other day, God made me warn them three more times last couple of months. Really specific stuff from the scripture. And Andy Westrup and the rest, you know what their response was? We think you just don't like us. That's it. That's it. So they just so they didn't have anything to say about the scripture because I didn't give anything of my own opinion, just the scripture. So in other words, oh yeah, well that's great, but you know we're not interested in that. We just think, you know. So in other words, you know what I said about where the perpetrator tries to make the victim. That's what they're doing. Except I know this now, so it just slid off me you know oh okay so you're innocent and this is somehow all just about me you know and I thought what do you want me to do now Lord and then the thing I wasn't ready for because I really wasn't ready I'm not sure I'm ready now God said to me come out not only that he said follow me out I'm leaving as well you know he says come out because what happens to them now is on their own heads. And I'm like, mm, I don't think I can do that. Well, you know, he's given me a really hard time till I've, that's why I'm saying it out loud because as witnesses that know that, you know, I've said it now, that he's really said to me, you're not going back. You're not going to speak to them again unless I specifically tell you, you know, that now whatever happens to them now, I'm, and I've, can't tell you what that is I don't know but whatever happens that, that all that God has said to me is don't feel guilty don't feel responsible you've done everything I asked you to do now leave so I think it's a bit scary for them so whatever I got a funny feeling whatever happens next may not be great for them but anyway so I am the first customer of my own sermon <laughs> That's all that page nine is about, is just explaining that. So you can help me by reminding me that I'm not to let myself get entangled, no matter how tempting, unless I'm sure that God has specifically told me to do something specific. Help me to not be lured into wrestling on the floor with them anymore. You'll never guess what they've done. We're finished, but you'll never guess what they've done. A couple of officers knew that everything I said was exactly 100% right. They knew it. So they went into bat, right? Including Paul Gardner. He knows. So they're having, by December, they've created this new thing, open like open leadership so they've explained that the leaders are still the leaders and THQ is still in charge but we're going to create this thing where you can give us your opinion you know you can tell us what you want you can give us your opinion and we'll take it into account we'll be a better leadership do you remember our sermon about Laodicea the last church what does Laodicea mean the church of people's opinions and I'm like so you've taught people error for 30 years and now you think you'll fix it 
by going to the people that you've taught error to for 30 years to ask them what their opinion is about what should be right. What's missing from all of that? The Bible's not to be found anywhere. There's no reference to going to the scripture for anything. So, you know, it's a Homer moment. Duh. <laughs> anyway, I grizzled enough there. So we're finished, but do you have any questions or I guess if you if you can just own the fact that there really is a limit there's a limit to what you can do and when you reach it it's not just okay it's an instruction to disengage and leave not just for your own safety but because there's someone else down the road that will listen and the fact that you can understand these things please read this over a few times means that then God can use you somewhere because someone who doesn't know that you may come across them so hopefully if you can dig this out or find it or just remember you might be able to help them disengage when talking it through or praying it through with them you know that they are hanging on in a situation where actually they need to leave because if they stay they'll end up you know squish so next week, we're taking a break because even more people than today will be away. So rather than, because um, it's long weekend, so uh, rather than, you know, doing something and then, you know, 60% or 70% of the people won't be here to hear it, let's take a deliberate break still read your bible still pray still consider the things and then we'll we'll come the week after and that's it so who like to pray us out i'm seeing who's looking away the most which is joseph uh. <laughs> i didn't ask you to pray but since you volunteered <laughs> Thank you.